conversely, they assess that a tax accountants destroy £47 and advertising executives £11 for every pound that they generate. Now, such calculations are clearly contentious in their detail and the methodology is slightly mysterious. But the overall point is clear and it nicely calls into question what constitutes productive work, worth and social utility. And those are questions which tend, as it were, not to get asked. So where do we go from there? Well, if we construe utopia as a form of constructive sociology, we need to think holistically about a better kind of society, which will have to involve measures of social value other than GDP, and thus a quite different notion of growth. And I think that one of the problems about a critical take on the discourse of austerity is that ecological constraints do point to a need for reduced consumption. And arguments for a more sustainable society need to embed the idea that this reduced consumption may be accompanied by an increase in quality of life. Um, and, and I think whereas Karen suggested that there's a kind of leadership from the, public set, from the Conservative Party in, in relation to this, um, I can see this being mobilised, uh, particularly around the discourse of well-being, in the neoliberal pro project as a way of arguing as it were the material things don't really matter, when uh, of course, uh, especially for those who don't have them, they matter very much. I would argue that a better society must have the following features, ecological sustainability, equality, Revaluation of what counts as production and wealth. Um, <coughs> a thinking in terms of uh, Miriam Glucksmann's uh, formulation of total social organisation <coughs> of labour and a revaluation of care so that you look at all the work that goes on both inside and outside the market. A basic income guarantee, um, a focus on the quality of life and well-being and recognition of the intrinsic work worth of education. And if you join up the basic income guarantee with the recognition of the intrinsic work of education, you would actually produce a situation in which people go, could go to university at any stage in their life they saw fit, rather than it being something you had to do as an investment in a credential to buy a place in the labour market, irrespective of the actual content of the degree. A different kind of society would have huge implications for the place of education and higher education in particular. I watched Vince Cable on Andrew Marr on Sunday morning. He, talk about, he talked about um, new providers entering the market and FE colleges supplying degrees. So that's apparently what we're doing. We're providers supplying degrees. And as we know, the discourse around HE, which emerges from the Brown Report and the Condemn Policies, is all about education as a commodified private good exchangeable in the labour market. In some ways, I find the fundamental philistinism of Brown more terrifying than the social inequity. Defending the sector against cuts and defending future students against concomitant fee rises is wholly necessary, but we do need to ask a wider question. What is education for? What would education and higher education mean in a society constructed on more sustainable and equitable principles? The purpose of a university should not be primarily to supply degrees and credentials for the labour market, but to create an educated citizenry. And it follows that there should be no necessary assumption that people go into HE directly from school. People find out what they're really interested in at different ages. And it changes. Most of our school and post-school education is also heavily biased away from the kind of craft-based practices discussed by Richard Sennett in his recent book on craftsmanship. And in particular, our mu music education is parlous. Among the myriad problems of creating an alternative discourse about a possible future is confronting the deep anti-statism of political discourse across the political spectrum. Most of the principles I've alluded to entail the action of a democratically accountable centralised state as well as accountable local government. 
And as Polly Toynbee has pointed out, much of the rhetoric about localism is about reinstating inequalities. For example, the plan for business rates to be returned to the areas where they're generated. Another issue is the destruction of the legitimacy of the collective subject. During the 1984 miners' strike, which I can remember, for example, the, the phrase the right to work was transformed from a collective demand of the working class into a justification of the individual right to strike break. And last week at an open space participatory democracy event in Bristol, I was struck by the combination of really widespread anger and a simultaneous understanding of action as something wholly individualised, such as moving your bank account from the big four, rather than envisaging collective political action. I don't have time to really to elaborate on the implied view of people and their relations that's embedded in this current discourse, all on their alternatives, but I think that the self that is structurally interpolated by neoliberalism corresponds precisely to Marx's description of alienation, where modes of paid work separate people from the process and product of labour and encourage them to view themselves as a marketable product to invest in, thus necessarily to conceive of their relations with one another in the same way. This is the commodification or alienation of self and of species being that are two of the four elements of alienation that Marx talks about. We do need to imagine ourselves otherwise as the agents and subjects of the transition to a quite different kind of society. The imaginary reconstitution of self is part of the imaginary and actual reconstitution of society and the role in education of this at all levels is crucial. And one writer I found especially useful here is Roberto Unger, who talks about uh, the need to develop, in children in particular, a prophetic identity, the need to define ourselves and to encourage our children to define themselves as what they might become, rather than in terms of where they come from. And this should be embedded in education for children, but for adults it is also, for Unger, embedded in processes of what he calls democratic experimentalism or collective improvisation. So that we need to resist at that very deep level of the self the kinds of views of who we are, what our relations with each other should be and what education is for that are being foisted on us by the current discourse of the condemned.